Hello, I'm JJ Joaquin, and welcome to Philosophy and What Matters, where we discuss things that matter from a philosophical point of view. Now, today's episode is about the philosophy of probability. Bertrand Russell once said that probability is the most important concept in modern science, especially as nobody has the slightest notion what it means. Now, claims like there's a 30% of rain, Trump will likely win this election, there's a million to one odds that will win the lottery, all carry probability information. But what do they really mean? Are probabilities something out there in the world? Or do, do they only measure our degree of confidence that some event will happen? Now, joining us to discuss the philosophy of probability and why it matters, we have Brandon Feitelson, Distinguished Professor of Philosophy at the Northeastern University. So hello, Professor Feitelson. Welcome to Philosophy and What Matters. Hi, JJ. Thanks a lot for having me. It's a pleasure. OK, so before getting into our main topic, let's first discuss your philosophical background. You trained in mathematics and physics, and you've been a research science, scientist in NASA. So how did you end up in philosophy? Yeah, so uh, my dad's a theoretical physicist, and uh, so I grew up, I was always interested in math and physics for that reason, and I studied those things as an undergraduate at the University of Wisconsin. Um, I also had a chance to take a few philosophy courses as an undergrad there with um, some really great people, Malcolm Forster, uh, Elliot Sober, Ellery Ells, Fred Dretzky, there, so I was, I was really lucky. Um, and I got, I've been very lucky in general. I, I was fortunate enough to get an internship at NASA uh, right early on in college. And um, then I ended up with a permanent research position there. Um, but I uh, decided pretty much right away after starting that job that I, it wasn't really for me. Um, I think partly, there are a couple of reasons. One, I started to realize that the questions that I was really interested in were more foundational in nature than the questions that you know the scientists were pursuing another thing was it, it even then and this was back in the in the early 90s even even then in the united states science in some sense was was kind of a rat race i mean it was you know you really had to uh, apply for grants and so a lot of what you did was like ask people for money and uh, and then you had to make long-term commitments to work on a particular thing Mm -hmm. eh, none of this really appealed to me. Um, and so I thought for a while about what I would want to do. And for a combination of lifestyle reasons and things I was interested in, I thought being a philosophy professor made sense. So um, I reached out to my old professor, Malcolm Forster. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, one thing led to another. And eventually uh, I was back in grad school in Wisconsin again, uh, this time getting a PhD in philosophy. That took nine years, though, because I didn't really have a lot of philosophy backgrounds. So I had to get a master's first, and that took four years, and then I took five years to get a PhD. Learned a lot of philosophy in those nine years, and um, was just, again just very fortunate to work with people who were interested in very similar things: mm -hmm. probability uh, in in science and um, in epistemology and decision theory, and and so it was kind of perfect for me. And so I ended up just sort of falling into that, and I really never looked back. You know, since then. So uh, what is philosophy for you? you? You mentioned about foundational issues in science and mathematics, but what do you think is philosophy all about? Yeah, yeah, you know, that's interesting. Um, I don't think too much about metaphilosophy, but I guess one thing that always fascinated me about philosophy was, at least ideally, normatively, I always think of philosophy as a discipline that has to take all questions seriously mm -hmm. and that always appealed to me because i always was interested in just understanding the world better and and in order to understand the world you know one question leads to another question leads to another question and there's just no predicting mm -hmm. where those questions will lead and philosophy it really is still the only i mean being a philosopher is the only occupation I know where you can just spend your life following the arguments where they lead, <laughs> wherever that may end up okay. without regard to that in advance. And that kind of freedom and um, 
seriousness about all questions. That's what appeals to me about philosophy. Okay, so who else influenced you to pursue a career in academic philosophy? I would say it really was just those folks that I met um, in my undergrad course, the few undergrad courses I took. Terry Penner was another uh, person who I took ancient philosophy with as an mm -hmm. undergrad, and uh, he had a big impact on me. Um, uh, again, someone who takes all questions seriously and really just wants to discuss and figure things out. And, you know, everyone in Wisconsin was like that when I was there. That really, I try to carry that spirit with me when I'm in my life now. Yeah. So your undergrad training had a huge impact in your philosophical thinking. It did, really. And then grad school, of course, I was there for nine more years just doing <laughs> philosophy with, with those same folks. And yeah, it was just that kind of place where you just did philosophy and you thought about things and talked about philosophy all the time and just tried to figure things out. Yep. So how, how did your mathematical training and your physics training help you in doing philosophy? Well, you know, yeah. So what I've been, I guess, been most interested in is the application of mathematical models to generally to all questions. So I'm interested in how they're applied in mathematics and physics, hmm. um, you know, in the special sciences. And I'm also interested in how they might be applied in philosophy. And so that led me into this field of formal epistemology which really is about, you know, the application of mathematics, certain kinds of mathematical models to, if you will, the clarification of epistemological concepts. Like belief and knowledge and so on. Uh, yeah, and degree of belief and preference and, you know, all these related concepts, yeah. Yeah, so let's go now to our main topic. So what's probability all about? Perhaps you can distinguish between a probability with respect to arguments and inferences and probability with respect to claims and sentences. Yeah, yeah. So I, I guess um, I tend to just think about probability as something that attaches fundamentally to propositions. So for instance, it, think about the truth predicate. If you say, oh, that statement is true or that proposition is true or that proposition is false. Mm -hmm. I tend to think of probability as similar structurally to that kind of thing. So instead of saying something's true, you could say, oh, it's, you know, it's more probable than not. Or, you know, it's has a has a 50 percent chance of being true or something like that. OK, so, so I, yeah, I yes. tend to think of it that way as fundamentally attached to propositions. OK, so you're thinking about probability like a truth predicate. So it's a property of sentence. Oh, sorry, propositions. Yeah, that's how I think of it. I tend to think of it as just fundamentally applying to propositions. Mm -hmm. Some propositions are more probable than others, um, just like some are true and some are false. Mm. <laughs> okay. So probability theory is used in a lot of branches of knowledge. You have natural sciences using probability theory, decision sciences, economics, and so on. But you could, could you tell us about the history behind the theory? Well, you know, I'm, I'm not so much of a historian. I mean, most of my work on probability has been about the application of what would be more understood in contemporary terms as probability models. And so the concept, the concept of a probability model is a relatively new one. Mm -hmm. So the, the way we understand probability models in the modern sense really started with Kolmogorov in the 1930s. Um, and so it's a relatively new idea, but, but the basic ideas behind, before we got to that level of precision uh, with, with the concept of a probability model, uh, which is what the modern people are talking about when they talk about probability. Uh, before then, you know, the history of probability is not that long. I mean, really, you know, it's basically the, not until the 17th century that you get people who are doing things that we would now call sort of forebears of probability theory. You know, so Pascal, Fermat, people like that in the in the 17th century. And then in the 18th century, you had Thomas Bayes. And until that point, I would say that first hundred years of what we would now call the precursors of probability theory. Mm -hmm. Most people, I think it's fair to say a lot of the applications were to things like games of chance, uh, you know, dice and coins and, you know, things where physical systems where there's physical symmetries, you know, that you can turn into like lotteries or games of chance. Mm -hmm. And I think that was really a large part of the early emphasis 
And then you get into the 19th century, people like Gauss and Laplace um, and John Venn. And there you're getting more into also what would now be known as mathematical statistics, mm -hmm. uh, the theory of errors of observation and normal distributions and things like that. Um, but it really, I would say it really isn't until the 20th century that you get a really rigorous presentation of what we would now call probability models or probability theory. And that would be, I actually think John Maynard Keynes's book, um, A Treatise on Probability from the 1921, I think that book deserves a lot more credit. There's a lot more stuff in there that really appears in a rigorous way for the first time than he usually gets credit for. <laughs> um, usually people credit um, Kolmogorov and, and later people, but actually a lot of the stuff's already in, in John Maynard Keynes's work in the 20s. And his teacher, W.E. Johnson, uh, did a lot of really interesting work on probability theory before that, uh, back in the late 19th century. Um, uh, but, but like I said, most of my work on the on on in the philosophy of probability, I would say, really starts with Keynes, you know, or or maybe Frank Ramsey, who was a contemporary of Keynes's. He yeah. wrote a very famous paper called Probability and Truth, Truth and Probability, and um, but they were contemporaries. That was around the same time, and so. For me, that's where really the modern notion of probability and philosophy of probability really starts with people like Keynes and Ramsey, uh, and then of course Kolmogorov yeah, in in the 30s. Um, um, so that's kind of a potted history uh, of it. Um, <laughs> like I said, my work is mostly the stuff in the 20th century and the 21st century. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's get to Maynard, John Maynard again. So what what's your interest here in Keynes' idea about probability? Well, yeah, so Keynes' his, his book is really the, I would say, the most serious attempt to try to codify a notion of probability um, that's really very general. This is and, before Kolmogorov's uh, actions, right? Yeah, yeah, this is, this is uh, before that. Mm -hmm. So he presents, he presents a theory, though, that's it's basically equivalent to, to some of the theor simple theories that Kolmogorov later presented. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but but Keynes's idea was he was thinking of probability as an extension of logic. Mm -hmm. So um, really, it's a general kind of relation between propositions, just like logical consequences, a general relation between propositions, right? You could talk about some uh, uh, some conclusion following from some premises, or you could talk about some conclusion being made probable by some premises, right? And so that that was the kind of notion that Keynes was interested in. Um, and I'm very much interested in logic and the relation to probability. So that really appealed to me. Like, could you have some general notion of how strong an argument is that uses probabilistic ideas mm -hmm. uh, to try to measure the strength of arguments in a very general way? Um, that was sort of the dream, you know, that, that Keynes mm -hmm. had. And people later, uh, like Carnap, tried to pick up on that and, 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 and work that out. I, 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 unfortunately, I wouldn't say that that was a very successful research program, but I do think it led to some really important insights and a lot of really good work and all subsequent work in probability. Um, so I still think there's tons of wisdom in that Keynes uh, book. Mm. Uh, there's still a lot of things. Uh, I just learned something new uh, the other day that uh, that really Keynes had introduced a, a concept that I thought had only been introduced much later. Mm -hmm. um, in what in the war, but you know, so I every time I pick that book up, I feel like I learned <laughs> something that I didn't know was in there. Um, so, so, what is this concept? This new concept? Uh, well, it's 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 a uh, it, it's it's a thing that's known um, as, as a Bayes factor. Mm -hmm. uh, and what is that? Well, that's like a measure of how strong uh, a piece of evidence is for a hypothesis. Mm -hmm. um, it's 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 basically would now think of it as a measure of how strong uh, two propositions are correlated, how strongly are they correlated with each other, uh, and the, there's one way of measuring that which is called the Bayes factor. It's sometimes called the likelihood ratio, mm -hmm. and uh, I had always thought that it was people like Turing and I.J. Good and um, and people like that who had really uh, come up with the Bayes factors, um, uh, and well, they certainly did a lot of work with them, but actually. Keynes gives a rigorous presentation of them in his in, in his book. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was new to me. I just discovered that recently. Um, 
Yeah, so so Keynes had a big impact on me, and then later Carnap. Um, and what appealed to me was the is the generality of really trying to do use probability in a way that's as general as logical concepts are. Okay, so what's, like I said, I don't think it worked out, but but it, but it was a cool <laughs> idea. Okay, so what's the relationship between that notion of probability with inductive inference or induct, inductive arguments? Yeah, yeah, that's basically the same kind of thing. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so the idea is to have a general notion, a general way of measuring how strong is an argument mm -hmm. and um, using probabilistic concepts to model that. And there's various ways you can, do, you can of course, do that. Um, uh, uh, so that's basically is when people talk about the strength of inductive arguments, that's they're talking about what Keynes was trying to explicate. <laughs> and then later what Carnap was trying to explicate is very is a very similar idea. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, it's this it was a dream that I don't think really was re ever realized. But um, but but it led to a lot of really interesting, interesting work in probability. Okay, now let's turn to our main question, the philosophical issues concerning probability. I think the big philosophical issue is about the interpretation of probability. What exactly is probability? Is it something out there in the world? Or is it something about the scope of our knowledge about things? Now, there are several interpretations of probability in the literature. So let's begin with the classical interpretation. What is this theory all about? Well, let's see. Would it be all right if I reframe the discussion here a little bit? Uh, it's all right. I I have a different way of framing the discussion. So traditionally, you're right. The way people usually frame the discussion is that you've got this theory, like say Kolmogorov's theory of probability or Keynes, this doesn't matter. You've got some formal theory of probability. And then there's all these different ways of interpreting it, right? So there's subjective interpretations and objective interpretations. I actually don't, I don't really like that framing. Okay. okay. I think that's not really the best way to think about what's going on. So let me let me reframe it, and then we can we can address all the same questions within the different frame. I think um, here's how I think of it. So you've got these formal models, these mathematical models. Mm -hmm. Let's just call them probability models. And there's lots of different kinds of probability models out there, right? Um, and there have been and 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 new ones are developed all the time. You know, this is what mathematical statisticians do and machine learning people. And so people are always developing new probability. So let's just talk about probability models. And these are just mathematical models that obey certain principles of probability, right? Mm -hmm. And now I, I tend to think of it this way. So you've got these models and now the question is, well, what are they useful for? <laughs> okay. So, so, so let me give you an analogy. So, you know, in physics, there's all kinds of models. For instance, there are Newtonian models mm -hmm. of planetary motion. And then there are Einsteinian models. And for that matter, there are Keplerian or Ptolemaic models. Mm -hmm. And I just tend to think, well, okay, we've got these models. What are they good for? So it turns out some of them are better for certain purposes than others. Mm. Uh, some of them are better for making predictions or explaining certain phenomena and others are better for other explanations or other predictions and so on. So that's how I tend to think in general in science of the application of mathematical models. You can ask, well, what are they useful for and in which contexts? Mm -hmm. Um, and that shifts the question, you see. So we're now we're not we're now we're not asking what is probability. I'm not sure I understand that question, but I do understand the question. Hey, we've got these mathematical models. What are they useful for, and in which contexts? Mm -hmm. Now it just becomes like any other part of science where you've got mathematical models and you're applying them for different purposes. You can ask, well, are they useful for this purpose? Are they more or less useful than these other models for this purpose in this context? Okay, that's how I prefer to frame this. And so this means also I'm a pluralist. So <laughs> I think there are many things in nature and in the world that can be modeled in better or worse ways for various purposes using probability models. Mm. Um, and so let's take some examples. Um, Let's let's just take physics, for instance, let's not even and then we can get to uh, we can get to other kinds of prob other applications of probability models. But let's just take modern physics. There's plenty of applications of probability models in modern physics, for instance, in quantum mechanics, uh, when we 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 use probability models to model how likely it is that certain uh, measurements will be made in certain systems. 
and we and we think those are really good useful models for that purpose um, and also in statistical physics you know we use probability models to model things even even in classical statistical physics mm -hmm. so you know they're they appear to be very useful and they make good predictions they seem to be explanatory about certain things in nature and so i would put it this way if you take your best theory of the physical world uh let's just, and i'm going to assume it includes like quantum mechanics for instance mm -hmm. then i think if you accept that theory then you've got good reason to think that there are natural phenomena which are well modeled using probability theory using mm -hmm. probability models I think that's pretty much all there is to, to thinking there's good reason that there's probably to think there's probabilities in nature mm -hmm. Be because, okay, forget about probability. Think about any theoretical property. Think about mass. Mm -hmm. Think about energy. Think about space time curvature. Why do we think that those things exist in nature? Well, because our best theories postulate them in a way that seems to be predictively and explanatorily indispensable. That's mm -hmm. why we think they exist. Same thing's true of probability in physics. So of course there's probability in nature. I mean, I'm just not sure what the question is. If you accept modern physics, then I think you are basically committed to there being probabilities in nature. Because what does that mean? It just means that probability models play an indispensable explanatory and predictive role in the theories we accept as best of nature. That's all there is to being committed to probabilities in nature, or for that matter, to being committed to there being mass in nature or energy or any other theoretical entity or electrons. You accept the electron theory. It says they're electrons. So you think they're electrons. <laughs> End of story. That's it. So I think the same thing about probability. So yes, I think there are probabilities in nature. Now, of course, that view could be revised if mm. a future theory came along and, and no longer appeared that probability was indispensable. Then sure, we could, we could change our minds. But I think there's very, very good reason to think that there are probabilities in nature, as good as there are reasons to think there are electrons in nature. No, I, I like that argument. So you're you're basically presenting an indis, indispensability argument, a kind of pragmatic argument for this one as well. <laughs> I mean, look, I, I but I tend to be a very naive realist about everything. So like when I read Euclid, I proved there were infinitely many prime numbers from mm. which it follows there are numbers. So I think there are numbers. What's okay. the problem? <laughs> No, I mean, no. you can you, look, you can talk yourself out of anything. And if you're in an epistemology seminar and you're paying very close attention to skeptical doubts, mm -hmm. then you can talk yourself out of anything. But that's just not reasonable. Mm -hmm. No one's a skeptic. <laughs> so if you accept physics, then you think there's lots of things, electrons, space time curvature, no, um, right. all kinds of weird right. stuff. <laughs> no, I like that, that idea about models. So probability models represent things in the world. So it might represent uh, the quantum phenomenon. It might represent as well as our decision making. Right? Yes, exactly. And in <laughs> fact, I think it can be very useful as well mm -hmm. for those purposes. And But we see this a lot, right? I mean, there's lots of mathematical models that are useful all over the place. For instance, take linear algebra. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, take matrix mechanics. It's used <laughs> everywhere, right? right? Linear algebra is everywhere. Right. It's it's useful as a modeling tool all over the place in science. And so is probability. And to that extent, yeah, there's good reason to think that, uh, quote unquote, there are probabilities in all of these domains. OK, so let's go to the interpretations of these models in terms of how they work in explaining phenomena. For example, in classical, the classical interpretation, the, the Fermat, Pascal interpretation. What is it good for? Okay, so um, well, again, I I wouldn't I I that question is a little strange to me. So the way I would put it is, here's how I would say it now. I mean, the, you know, they didn't have the the technology and the and the language to say this back in those days. But I think what I would say now is, well, what what those guys who were working on games of chance, what they were onto was the fact that there's a class of probability models that's very useful for describing certain phenomena that exhibit certain kinds of symmetries. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you've got a, a die that's six sided and it's, it obeys certain physical symmetries, then, you know, when you throw it, you know, <laughs> there's roughly an equal chance that it's going to come up on one of the faces, you know, um, that's be due to physical symmetries and things like that. 
And I think that just shows that probability is very useful for making predictions about those kinds of games of chance. Or take a lottery, for instance. If you've got a big lottery and you, you mix up a bunch of balls in an urn and you shake them up and you mix them up real good and you pick one out, um, there's a roughly equal chance that you're going to draw each of the balls. And so those classical models, which work on, they're basically finite frequency models, right? They're basically... Uh, you divide by the number of cases, you assume each one's equally probable. They apply really well to, to cases where there are these kinds of physical symmetries, like lotteries or games of chance. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's where those models uh, are, are most applicable, um, or that's one of the areas where they're very applicable. But you see, they're also applicable in statistical physics. I mean, so mm -hmm. uh, when you talk about the, the motion of Brownian motion or motion of lots of small particles, you can describe those also using... I mean, essentially very similar kinds of probability models that exploit certain physical symmetries. So how does, so, uh, yeah. how does relative frequency theory, Bayesianism fit in your picture of interpreting probability? Well, okay, so, so yeah, so Bayesianism is a little bit, I would say a little bit different. Mm -hmm. so, the, so the classical theory is, is, I would just consider it, I mean, I tend to think of everything ultimately in more or less Bayesian terms, but to me that just means I think of everything in terms of what class of probability models are we talking about, and then what are they useful for modeling, you know, so um, those classical models are useful for games of chance, they're useful for things where there are certain kinds of symmetries, and that corresponds roughly to a kind of finite frequency way of thinking about probability. Um, finite frequencies those are basically just probability models, right? So finite frequencies obey the laws of probability. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's another thing. Probability is very useful for modeling, finite frequencies, with, with, uh, because those obey the laws of probability. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, I mean, I guess I would just say, you know, let's talk about uh, some phenomenon or other, whether it's in the natural world or it might not be, it, you might get into normative things, okay? But those, to me, those are just phenomena too. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, then there's things you can use to model, to model those. So, um, so yeah, so, but, you know, usually this objective subjective distinction, I don't really love those words, but I think normally what people mean by that is like, basically you've got some prob class of probability models. And then the question is, well, are you modeling some, let's say phenomenon in nature? Mm -hmm. that say doesn't intrinsically involve human minds so like lotteries or you know mm -hmm. um, other things where there's basically finite frequencies going on or something like that or quantum mechanics that's another example of an objective kind of probability uh, because you're modeling a physical phenomenon right um, that's let's just say mind independent depending on your interpretation of quantum <laughs> mechanics um, but you know i would think of it as being mind independent um, Right. And, and then there are the, let's say, the mind dependent applications of probability models. And there's plenty of those because there's plenty of things uh, involving human minds that we think we can also model uh, with probability models. Um, and uh, so when people talk about Bayesianism, I mean, that's th that word means a lot of things. But I think typically they're now now you're getting into a discussion usually of degrees of belief mm -hmm. and so now we're talking about mental things that we're modeling mm -hmm. uh or you know either mental or epistemological um kinds of phenomena that we're that we're modeling and probability turns out to be useful for a lot of those things too um to varying degrees so for instance um if you're a psychologist well then what you're mainly interested in is how people actually, what, what are their degrees of confidence actually like? So when we talk about how confident a person actually is, mm -hmm. well, what's the structure of those degrees of confidence? How do they behave? Uh, are they accurately modeled using probability models? Well, sometimes they are, mm -hmm. but as, as we know from a lot of research in behavioral economics, people's degrees of confidence don't always line up with the probability calculus too, <laughs> too well. Um, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. We have your biases and heuristics that we fall into, which can make us deviate from uh, probability in certain ways. Um, but we still think probability is useful, you know, even for, for modeling some of those phenomena. 
And when it's not useful, like when it when it goes wrong, when it's not accurate, say, then I think we think that's interesting as well. So when people like Kahneman and Tversky discovered that um, people's actual degrees of belief often systematically deviate from probability, mm. they don't obey the laws of probability uh, in, in certain systematic ways. That was very interesting. I mean, and the reason they won the Nobel Prize for that stuff was because it wasn't just because, oh, that's interesting psychology. It was because people thought that there was something normative about probability. Mm -hmm. So that the deviations were somehow bad, <laughs> right? It wasn't just, oh, this is how people's minds work. So give me a Nobel Prize. It was here's how people's minds work. And there are systematic deviations from this structure of probability, which we somehow think is normative mm -hmm. in some way. And that's why it was so interesting. That's why they won the Nobel Prize. It was the deviation between the models, which are taken to be normative, and the actual behavior of human confidence. Um, and so that's something I've done a lot of research on, because I'm most interested in the application of probability to normative concepts. Mm -hmm. So to like rational degrees of confidence or rational degrees of evidential support or things like that, things that would come up in epistemology. That's really what my focus has been on, how to use probability to model those normative concepts. But I still think of it the same way. OK, so you've got some phenomenon. Oh, it's a normative. OK, so it's a normative phenomenon. That's mm -hmm. fine. I mean, we're all naturalists ultimately, right? So what? <laughs> I mean, OK, it's normative, but still it's a phenomenon. And and then we use probability to model those normative phenomena in certain ways. And I think probability is is pretty useful for modeling some of these normative concepts. I, a lot of people seem to agree with that. If they didn't, then Kahneman Tversky never would have won the Nobel Prize because <laughs> why would they? No one would care. I mean, yeah, you know, right. um, the reason that was important was because people thought there was something normative about probability. That is, they thought that probabilities were useful for modeling the normative structure of confidence, not just the descriptive structure of actual psychological confidence. And that's really that interface that's something that i'm very very interested in that descriptive normative interface of people's beliefs or degrees of belief and how they're structured and the extent to which probability models are useful for modeling them that's kind and so that's the way i tend to think about think about this but as i said i'm a pluralist because i i look at the world and think well there's all these phenomena out there mm -hmm. some of them are are usefully modeled using probability those are the ones i'm interested in because i like probability Okay, so let's go to your research, the rational norms and how probability fits into yeah. this picture. But, but before that, let, let's, uh, I'll, I'll just ask the question. So we're thinking about probability models in terms of the standard probability theory? Is that? Theory? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, and that's pretty, that's pretty universal. I mean, so for the most part, I mean, philosophers worry about non-standard probabilities and weird weird probabilities. Mm. But for the most part, when people talk about probability in science, you can understand them as talking about, you know, what Kolmogorov was talking about or what Keynes was talking about. Those things have the same formal structure. Okay, so could, could you give us some of the principles of uh, probability theory, standard probability theory? Oh, yeah, yeah. So um, probability is actually really simple. Mm. Um, you can think of it, there are basically just three principles mm. that probability satisfies. One is that if, if some proposition is true in every possible world, then its probability is one, mm -hmm. or that is, it has a hundred percent chance of happening because it's true in every, it's true in every possible world. Okay. Okay. So that's, that's like one principle. Anything that's true in all possible worlds has maximal probability. That makes sense. <laughs> um, here's another principle. There are no negative probabilities. Mm -hmm. That's just like, you know, also like we assume there are no negative lengths, <laughs> right? Okay, so it's similar to that. I mean, that's not really that substantive. And then the, the only really substantive principle is the third one, which is called the additivity principle. And that says if you have two mutually exclusive propositions, then the probability that at least one of them is true is just the sum of the individual probabilities of each claim. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hey. This is um, so, 
or right. another way to put it is the probability of a disjunction right. of mutually exclusive propositions is just the sum of the probabilities of the disjuncts. Mm -hmm. And that's it. That's <laughs> that's all. That's it. Any measure satisfying those three things is a probability measure, and any model satisfying those is a probability model. Okay, so let's go to your work about you mentioned about the Kahneman Tversky uh, literature. So, wh what is the probabilities you're doing here? Yeah, so um, so my research, uh, a lot of it early, especially early on, was about, and this relates to the Cardat Popper um, thing mm -hmm. that you that that we'll get to later. Mm -hmm. um, Carnap uh, and Popper were both interested in this thing called confirmation, and Keynes was too. In a way, what Keynes was talking about was also confirmation. So, what is confirmation? Think of it this way. It's a relation between propositions. It's and you can think of it as a relation of support. Mm -hmm. Right. So you could say one proposition supports the, the truth of one proposition supports the truth of the other to some degree. And if that happens, then the former is said to confirm the mm -hmm. latter. Right. So we could talk about an evidential proposition confirming or supporting a hypothesis. And then you could talk about degrees of support. Mm -hmm. Right. So and there's turns out there's lots of ways of measuring degrees of support that disagree with each other in interesting ways. And that's what my original my dissertation research was on. I've done a lot of research on that, how to measure degree of evidential support, degree of confirmation. Um, and so that and as I said, there's many proposals out there uh, and they disagree with each other in interesting ways. And I advocated for a certain way of measuring measuring that which is basically what i the Bayes factor the thing i was saying that keynes actually <laughs> talked about before anyone else did but he doesn't get credit for it um i mean he rigorously he really defined what it was he didn't call it that but um uh, by the way people only call it a Bayes factor out of deference to Bayes. but you know Bayes was writing you know 150 years before that um but it, but it's really not even right to attribute this to Bayes. that's it's not in there. It's not in there. It was really Keynes that rigorously identified this thing. So um, Bayes factors were used in World War II uh, to help uh, 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 decrypt the uh, the German Enigma code. Um, that was a work of Alan Turing and I.J. Good. Mm -hmm. uh, they used that as a measure of evidential support to try to gauge how strong the evidence was for certain certain codes and things like that. Um, so it's got a pretty long history and, and I give certain defenses of it. And psychologists got interested in this too. So a bunch of psychologists, uh, it was Dan Osherson, I think at Princeton who reached out to me originally and said, you know, we're interested in the psychology of confirmation, the psychology of evidential support. How do people make those judgments? And are these measures good for modeling those judgments? And, you know, it turned out that the, the measures I was defending actually are the ones that make the best predictions about people's judgments about mm -hmm. confirmation. But that was like a coincidence because I was giving like normative, just, you know, epistemological justifications for the normative status of these models. And it turned out, though, that actually those were pretty good predictors of certain kinds of judgments of support that people were making. Mm -hmm. um, and that got me into working on things like the conjunction fallacy and other other things, because it turns out you can use confirmation to explain away some of these um, deviations from rationality, quote unquote, that people uh, focused on. Um, so but instead of talking about probability, you focus on confirmation. And by doing that, you actually a lot of the things people say don't sound that crazy anymore. So a lot of the responses to some of those experimental uh, uh, stimuli that Kahneman and Tversky were using actually make a lot of sense if if you understand them as being about confirmation and not just probability. So if you understand them as being about degree of evidential support and not just how probable one thing is given another thing, mm -hmm. right? So um, yeah, so th so there's so basically Carnap described this in his work. There's two different notions basically at play here. There's conditional probability like how probable one claim is given another, that's one thing. But then there's degree of confirmation, uh, as we would call it now, and that's different because that has to do with not just how probable one thing is given another, but how much the probability is changed. So how much, uh, if you learn one thing, how much does that change the probability you assign to another thing? 
Mm. Right. So when you're thinking about arguments, for instance, you can think there's a couple different ways of thinking about how strong an argument is. You could think how probable is the conclusion given that the premises are true? Okay. That's one thing. But you could also ask a different question. How relevant are the premises to the conclusion? That is, how much do the premises raise the probability of the conclusion over and above its prior probability value? Mm -hmm. That is, before having taken into account the premises. And that's a completely different thing. Those are just different. And so my whole view about this is that there's really two dimensions of argument strength or of support. There's conditional probability and then there's confirmation. Okay. And my work has been on confirmation because I think relations of relevance are just more interesting and more subtle than relations of conditional probability. <laughs> and so modeling relations of relevance as confirmation turns out to be much more subtle. And that's why there's much more disagreement about how to do it, what yeah. the right ways to do it are. Um, and because it's more, it's more subtle, it's a more subtle thing uh, to do. And in fact, that was what the Carnap Popper debate was was about. Really, it, it was about these two different concepts and how they relate to each other. Okay, so um, could, could you give us? So my work has, yeah. Yeah. So could you give okay. us first uh, um, an example of each of these uh, notions: uh, conditional probability and relevance? Yeah. So, um, so right. So conditional probabilities is is, is like this. Um, you suppose that some premise is true, mm -hmm. and then you ask yourself, okay, given that a supposition, how likely is it that the conclusion is true? So okay. this is that's, that's one notion. So let me give you so let me give you an example that'll give you the contrast right away. Suppose I tell you that there's this guy Fred Fox, and he's a male, mm -hmm. and um, and I tell you I ask you the following question: How probable is it that Fred is not pregnant, given that he's been taking birth control pills, uh, you know, rigorously for the last year. <laughs> well, answer, it's very probable that he's not pregnant. 100%. That's right. <laughs> so, the, so, the, so the conditional probability is very high. But notice, it's not because the premise has any relevance there. Right, right. Right? So, right. so yes, the probability that he's not pregnant is very high, given that he's taking birth control pills. But it's the same as it would be, it's independent of whether he's taking, it would be high regardless of whether or not he took the pill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. That's the difference. So if what you're interested in is how relevant the premises are, well, in that case, there's zero relevance, even though there's very high probability. Mm -hmm. And that's the shortcoming of the traditional, the traditional way to measure argument strength. And this goes back to Keynes and many people since then, um, people still talk this way. They think, oh, you just take the conditional probability of the conclusion. But that doesn't make sense because would you say it's a strong argument for his non-pregnancy that he's been taking the pill, given, <laughs> knowing that he's male? No, that's not any reason at all to believe that he's not going to be pregnant. Mm -hmm. It's not relevant because mm -hmm. whether or not he does it, he's not going to get pregnant. So I think relevance is a necessary condition for something being a reason for something else. If it's not relevant, it's not a reason. Mm, nice, nice. Okay. Right. So, <laughs> so, so that's so. My view is that there's actually two dimensions of argument straight. They're both important. So, high probability is good, but also relevance matters. Mm -hmm. And that's where the theory of confirmation comes in, because that's about relevance, how to measure it, what's its structure, and it turns out to be very subtle and complicated and behave in a much different way than than just prob conditional probability does. So where, where does the Carnap Popper debate come in here? Right. So so Carnap, as I mentioned, he wrote uh, this book uh, called Logical Foundations of Probability. It's amazing uh, uh, work on probability, and there's a lot of stuff in that book. Um, but um, a lot of it is just about conditional probability. Not all of it, but a lot of it is just about conditional probability, right? the way Keynes was talking about conditional probability. So that was also what Keynes was really interested in. And Popper wrote a review of the book and he said, well, you know, Carnap, you're using this word confirmation, but confirmation has these two senses, right? It has the relevant sense and then the conditional probability sense. Mm -hmm. And so Carnap uh, 
in response to Popper, wrote a, just a preface to the second edition of his of Logical Foundations, in which he says, "Yeah, yep, that's right. There are these two notions." Um, and in fact, the book already had contained a whole chapter on relevance. <laughs> so it's so it's not like he, he didn't know about relevance. He he, he did, um, and you know, so he acknowledged that, and you know, was a little more careful in the preface about that. But the other book was already, I think, fine. So I think so. My view on the proper kind of controversy is that, you know, it was a little. It was basically Popper was being somewhat unfair and uncharitable to to, to Carnap because because in the book there's a whole chapter on relevance, which is tons of good stuff and, and very informative about the nature of relevance. But on the other hand, I will say Popper is right that more work needed to be done on different ways of measuring relevance, different ways of measuring confirmation. And, you know, Carnot basically conceded that point. Eventually, he was originally going to write another volume about that. He never got around to it, um, partly because, you know, that dispute with Popper got pretty nasty and Carnap did not like <clears throat> Carnap was a, he was not a fighter, you know. Popper liked to like fight with people, and and Carnap was not like that. He was he was a much more uh, more much more of a gentleman, I guess is what I would say. <laughs> um, and so he he wrote that preface, and then he never he never actually. And so my dissertation was really th that was the inspiration. My inspiration was the C Popper Carnap controversy, and then Carnap's response. And I'm like, well, why don't I just write my dissertation on the different ways of measuring conference? So that's what I did. So how do you measure confirmation? How, what's this relevance relation between premise and conclusion? Yeah, so there's, so right. So because this is just relevance, right? Mm -hmm. Well, there's lots of ways of saying that two propositions are probabilistically relevant to each other. That is, that one raises the probability of another. Uh, one way you could say it is that the conditional probability is greater than the unconditional probability. Mm -hmm. Right. So like the probability of H given E is greater than the probability of H unconditionally. That's one way to say it. But you could also say the probability of E given H is greater than the probability of E given not H. Those are equivalent. Mm -hmm. Those inequalities are. And in fact, there's a whole bunch of inequalities that are like that. They're that equivalent. They're all true if and only if the others are true in probability theory. But here's the cool thing. If you define measures based on each of those inequalities. So like you could take the difference between the conditional probability and the unconditional probability. Mm -hmm. Or you could take the ratio. Or you could take the difference between the probability of E given H and the probability of E given not H, mm -hmm. et cetera. And you could, you could, or the ratio of those, right? And so there's like a, a ton of ways of defining measures based on the same qualitative concept. Here's what's surprising, which is what I really explored in my dissertation, which is they all behave in different ways. They mm -hmm. all, place different orderings on pairs of evidence and hypotheses. So they don't even agree on which arguments are stronger than which. And so that means, in a sense, they're all measuring different kinds of relevance. Mm -hmm. Right. And so now the question becomes, this is cool, because what this does is it introduces, it opens up a whole class of different models of, of kinds of relevance. Right, right. And so now you get into the question of, well, which of these models are useful for modeling which relevance relations in mm. which contexts? And so um, I think there's, depending on the context of what, what kind of relevance you're measuring and what, you're, what the application is, there's lots of different answers to that. Um, however, I would say that um, if what you're interested in uh, is what Keynes and Carnap were interested in, which is, uh, thinking of these things as generalizations of deductive entailment or deductive implication, mm -hmm. right? So if, you, if you're thinking that way, then what you want is you want the measures to be such that if the evidence guarantees the truth of the hypothesis, then that's maximal confirmation. Mm -hmm. And it turns out there are very few measures of relevance that obey that property. But deductive there are some. Logic. Yeah, taking deductive logic as a special case, mm. right? So you want the valid argument, it's le at least the non-trivial valid arguments, mm. right? I mean, you, not the ones with contradictory premises or, okay, forget those, right? Forget the paradoxes of relevance or whatever. <laughs> Just like the ordinary, the ordinary valid arguments, you mm. want those to be the strongest, right? right? That's that's the old idea of inductive logic as a, it's a generalization of deductive logic. Mm. If you impose that constraint, then you get down to a much smaller set of measures.
and now you, you there's a, there's a lot that's a, turns out to be a surprisingly strong constraint and so now you're down to a small number of measures of argument strength in the logical tradition mm -hmm. and that's the, those are the kinds of things that i've been, those are the kind of models i've been exploring the most um because i'm interested in this project of argument strength in a logical sense in a way that generalizes logic mm -hmm. Okay, so but, how, but you might not be interested in that. Maybe you're interested in a different notion of relevance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that'd be fine too. Um, so I'm a pluralist, like I said, but <laughs> but that's a particular kind of relevance relation that we apply to argument ev evaluation. That that's as a logician one that I'm very interested in. Okay, so what's the relationship now between this kind of idea and uh, Kahneman Tversky literature? Oh yeah, yeah, good. So so one of the great examples that Kahneman and Tversky talk about is the conjunction fallacy. Mm -hmm. So what is that? OK, so th those are cases in which people uh, say that a conjunction is more probable than one of its conjuncts, mm -hmm. which can't be true because a conjunction is logically stronger. So there are strictly fewer possible worlds in which the conjunction is true. So that means any measure of how many worlds there are, which is all probability really is, it would have to be smaller for the, it can't be bigger for the conjunction than it is for one of the conjuncts, right? Because there's just strictly fewer worlds in which the conjunction is true. Mm -hmm. So that can't be more probable, okay? Um, because again, probably it's just a measure of how many, roughly the proportion of worlds in which a claim is true or something like that. So the, the conjunction is strong of a conjunct. So, so that's true. True. And so that looks like people are being irrational. They're giving this incorrect answer about probability. And that's and that's fair. And that's fair. But here's a really cool thing that um, me and, and some colleagues in psychology, mainly Vincenzo Krupi uh, and Katya Tentori, and then their colleagues uh, who have done a lot of work on this since then, mm -hmm. um, what we showed is that, yes, of course, a conjunction can't be more probable than one of its conjuncts. But if you ask a different question, which is, can a piece of evidence confirm a conjunction more strongly than it confirms one of the conjuncts? That mm. is, can it raise the probability of the conjunction more than it raises the probability? And the answer, of course, is yes. And in fact, you can prove some very general results that in all the kinds of examples that Kahneman and Tversky talk about, that's actually what's happening. Mm. There are cases in which the evidence that they give you confirms the conjunction more strongly because it's more relevant to the conjunction than it is to one of the conjuncts. In <laughs> fact, it might just be irrelevant to the one of the conjuncts, but strongly relevant to the conjunction. And there's no problem with that. And that's one of the ways in which relevance behaves differently than probability, right? Um, relevance is weird. You mm -hmm. can have something that's strongly relevant to a conjunction, but irrelevant to one of the conjuncts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's weird, right? I mean, that's strange. <laughs> How could something be strongly relevant to one to the conjunction, but irrelevant to this logical consequence of the conjunction? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and if you want a simple example, here's a simple example. Um, so you're suppose you're going to draw a, a card at random from a standard deck. OK. And um, you you want to know you're considering two hypotheses, right? It's the ace of spades versus it's an ace. Mm. Now, it being the ace of spades entails that it's an ace, right? Right. So you can think of ace as a conjunct in the ace of spades conjunction. So right. it's, it's like a case like that. Okay. Now, suppose you learn that the card is black. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's very relevant to the claim that it's the ace of spades. Right, right. Because right. that now becomes twice as probable mm -hmm. than it was a priori. It goes from 1 over 52 to 1 over 26. Because there are 26 black cards. Exactly. And right. only one of them is the ace of spades. But now ask yourself, <laughs> has it, if you learn the card's black, does that tell you anything about whether it's an ace? Nope. Nope. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and there you go. Right, right. And so, and so that's a, a, a very simple case that shows you that relevance just behaves differently than conditional probability. Yeah, but it raises my, my belief that I have the ace of spades. If yes. I have, yeah. And that's... Exactly, exactly. And so, yes, it would be crazy to say that it's more probable, given that it's black, that it's the ace of spades, than that it's an ace. Right. That's crazy. 
But would it be crazy to say that the evidence that is black confirms the ace of spades hypothesis more strongly than the ace hypothesis? No. Mm. <laughs> no, because it's not even relevant to the ace hypothesis at all. Right. But it's strongly relevant to the ace of spades hypothesis. So you have two notions here that's pulling you to different directions. Exactly. And this was Popper's point in his review of Carnap. He was saying, <laughs> hey, look, yeah, conditional probability is great, but you've also got this relevance thing, and sometimes they come apart. Mm. There's an even simpler kind of case where they come apart. So again, a kahneman tversky case, the base rate fallacy, the so-called base rate fallacy. So when you ask people to calculate how probable it is they have a rare disease based on a single positive test result from a pretty reliable test, they'll say, oh, it's very probable I have the disease. When in fact, if you calculate using base name, you find out it's still very improbable mm. that you have the disease. Okay, again, notice this can be understood as a conflation of two senses of confirmation. The probability that you have the disease, given just the single test result, is still very low. Right. But does that mean that the test result is not relevant to whether you have the disease? Of course it is. Of course it is. That's why you get, that's why you get the test. Right, right. Again, relevance goes a different way than probability. You can have strong relevance and low probability, or you can have high probability and no relevance. Okay, so what does it tell us about the norms of our rationality, the normative principles of rationality? Yeah, so that's, that's a really good question. Um, I tend to think that, um, and there's actually a lot of research on this now. This is a really popular area of research, which is, taking phenomena that appear to be irrational, mm -hmm. right? If you just apply some very naive probabilistic model to them, right? Very simplistic, like you just say, oh, we're just talking about the conditional probability, but we're not taking account relevance relations or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So what we did was we said, well, okay, that's one way to apply probability models to this, but if you apply it in a more sophisticated way, taking into account this distinction between two notions of confirmation, uh, then maybe the responses aren't, don't actually seem that crazy at all. And you recognize there are these two different things pulling in opposite directions mm -hmm. and people are, are going one way rather than another. But does that really mean that these, these people are, are acting or, or answering irrationally? So that's a really interesting question. And I, and now in, in the more recent literature, you've got people doing even more sophisticated things. So um, Kevin Dorst, who uh, is now at Oxford, but will be starting a professorship at, Pitt, at the University of Pittsburgh, he's doing work on higher order probabilities. So um, my, all my work's just been on first order probabilities, just probabilities of propositions, right? Mm. But what if you're uncertain about how confident you are in something <laughs> or how confident you should be, uh -huh. right? What if you're uncertain about that? And that's a second order probability, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so Kevin's research is fascinating because he shows that if there's uncertainty about, if there's this second order uncertainty about our own confidence and how confident we should be in things, then that can actually explain a lot of things that looked irrational if you just had only first order probability models to work mm -hmm. with. Um, and that's another example of this kind of research, which I, which I love because what it's, what it's do and it goes back to what i was saying at the beginning about probability modeling and the way i like to think about things there are lots of different kinds of probability models of lots of different kinds of phenomena both in the natural world and in the psychological realm and in the normative or epistemological realm and it it pays to be to be very careful about which models you're using which families of models you're allowing to draw from before you make any conclusions right mm -hmm. so it might be that some of your conclusions you're drawing are just because you have too limited a set of probability models at your disposal, that if you had a little bit more sophisticated use of those probability models, or just maybe richer class of probability models, that you could actually see these things in a different light, and maybe you could model them better. And maybe that would mean, for instance, that things we once thought were irrational, maybe aren't always irrational. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was just because we had too impoverished a set of models to really understand the, the, the true probabilistic phenomena in, in, in all the detail that we needed to understand them. Okay, so we're still talking about standard probability theory. How about non-standard yeah. models of probability? Yeah, so th that's, there's, there's also some of that. Um, you know, this, is, this gets into an interesting um, 
a more interesting, a general philosophical question. So, um, so, so for instance, let me just, so just to give an analogy to a, to a related field and, and a related dialectic that has come up in the, in the 20th century. So I mentioned that in logic, there are these so-called paradoxes of relevance, right? Mm. So if you just look at the classical definition of what it means for an argument to be valid, well, it just means that it's impossible for the premises to be true while the conclusion is false, right? So if the premises are already impossible, then the argument's valid doesn't matter what the conclusion is. Right. Uh, or, if, or if the conclusion's a logical truth, then the argument's valid doesn't matter what the premises are. Mm. So you might think, oh, that's weird. Doesn't that show some kind of weakness in the definition of validity? I don't actually think it does. And, but for me, it's because I think in order to give a proper analysis of relevance, you need probability models. Mm -hmm. Deductive models just aren't rich enough to capture relations of relevance. And then once you have probability models on board, you can see that these cases are not problematic. Take the case where you have a tautological conclusion. Okay, that has probability one given any premise, but are any premises relevant to it? No, <laughs> because they have prob they're like the Fred Fox case, but at the All extreme, right. All right. they have probability one no matter what. Mm -hmm. So when you have this richer notion of argument strength, you realize these aren't strong arguments. Mm -hmm. So and then relevant. what I would, yeah, once you take relevance into account in mm -hmm. the right way using probability, you realize, oh, these are just cases of valid arguments, but they're irrelevant, so they're harmless. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I think the attempt to revise classical deductive logic to make it relevant was just a mistake. That was the wrong thing to do. Or to put another way, Yes, you can do that, but the way to do it is to add probabilities to the truth tables. <laughs> Put probabilities on the propositions and talk about relevance, and boom, there you have an explanation of relevance. Well, I'll you don't tell, need a new you don't need a new logic. Yeah, I'll tell Graham Priest about this. <laughs> oh, oh, we've talked plenty about this. Okay, so that, yeah. Uh, I love Graham. I love Graham Priest. Yeah, me too. So what's the feature of research and philosophy or probability. Oh, wait, wait, let me get back to the, but just one sec. Let me okay. get back to the thing, because that was just a metaphor. So okay. then what I, what I was going to say was the same sorts of things might happen in classical probability. So you might have cases where um, certain classical probabilistic notions like confirmation, for instance, you get these weird cases that don't seem to make sense. Mm -hmm. Now, some, I agree, something has to change there. You, you're going to need a new class of models, and that's right. But the question is going to be what kind of revisions of those models are required. And now it, it, it depends. It might be that there's still a way to explain those things using classical probability. It might, for instance, it might be that there's higher order probabilities you have to take into account. Okay, okay. Or, maybe, or maybe it's just a richer class of probabilities that, uh, that are required to supervene on the phenomenon or something mm -hmm. like that. So it, it, yes, these are cases where something has to change. Um, and so I agree with that. I, I would definitely agree that the, that the classical definition of validity, there's something weird about the paradox of relevance. I just think the best way to explain that and to, to move beyond that is, is to move to probabilistic notions rather than revising the deductive notions. Mm -hmm. And I would say something similar. I would, I would say, yeah, if you come up with cases where classical probability doesn't seem to work, um, then something's going to have to change. You're going to need some richer class of models. But then I think I would tend to want to be as conservative as possible when I'm extending the old models to new ones. Okay, that, you know, and then you just have to look on a case by case basis as mm. to how you're going to do that revision. Yeah, and, you know, it just depends on the case. But um, I would be inclined, I'm generally inclined to stick with classical logic <laughs> and, 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 and classical probably, unless there's really, I've tried everything. Mm -hmm. And there's just, so for instance, the liar paradox. Yeah. I mean, I don't see a way out of that, that preserve, I mean, there are ways out of it that preserve classical logic, but, but you've got to give up some pretty, so for instance, one way out of it is to say, yeah, you know, this idea that whenever you prove something, it's true, mm -hmm. eh, <laughs> maybe not, <laughs> you know, I mean, okay. So something's got to give within the classical cluster of concepts. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know what, maybe, maybe the logic in that case does have to go. I don't know. So yeah, so there are cases and there are cases um, and that happens in probability too. So I think you just have to take it on a case by case basis. Okay, so what's the future of research in philosophy of probability? 
there's so much interesting work being done in probability right now. It, there's a really a flourishing community of formal epistemologists who work specifically on probability. And um, like I said, the higher order probability stuff that that, that Dorst and other people are doing is is fascinating. I think there's sort of a ton of that. We're just sort of scratching the surface hmm. of higher order probability. Um, of course, there's the old perennial question of what's the relation between the traditional epistemic concepts and you know the more contemporary probabilistic ones like degree of belief and belief and you know what's the relation between those mm -hmm. i think there's a lot of interesting work being done on that hannes leitgev just wrote a book a few years ago that's really interesting about about the relation between full belief and partial belief um the really fascinating kind of new way of thinking about that um so and then there's um there's a lot of really interesting recent work on that i think will continue into the future on um if you will sort of reliableist or veritist epistemology and how to how does that bear on formal epistemology so what would be what would a reliableist or veritist formal epistemology look like philosophy of probability or degree of belief mm -hmm. and so there there, there have been all this work on how to use the concept of accuracy to justify or to to ground probabilistic models of belief or degree of belief and I, that stuff is fascinating. So Richard Pettigrew has written a bunch of really great stuff on that. And a lot of other researchers um, also are, are working on that stuff. Um, so yeah, there's, there's tons of, there's tons of, there's just so many things um, that are going on in relating to probability. There's also just, there's work on comparative probability or qualitative probability rather than quantitative probability. Mm -hmm. uh, and what, how, how do you provide a foundation for those more qualitative notions? You know, just the, the relation that one thing's more probable than the other. Um, What's the right way to to give a foundation for that or to understand where those principles come from? So there, you know, there's there's tons of stuff. There's tons of stuff. The good thing about probability is it hasn't been around that long, right? I mean, it's like I said, it's about basically a hundred years. Um, <laughs> that it's, I mean, in its real, you know, in its re, in the form of probability models right, as we now right, know them, right. and that just means there's tons of 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 work to be done. I also would say. A very important thing is that there's a lot of interdisciplinary opportunities. So machine learning, AI, statistics, all of these fields make heavy use of probability models of different sorts. Philosophers of probability need to get in there and be involved in those interdisciplinary projects, I, th I would say, um, because we have a lot to offer. We have a very interesting perspective on probability and how it works. And I think we could be very helpful on a lot of interdisciplinary work um, across, you know, the boundaries of computer science or physics or or other areas where probability is is used. So I think people should be doing doing more of that kind of thing, interdisciplinary work that relates because probability is one of these things that's in every field of inquiry. If you think about it, it's everywhere. As Bertrand Russell said, no one knows what it means, but everyone uses it. <laughs> That means there's great opportunities for philosophers to contribute mm. to interdis interdisciplinary projects. And that's something that I'm trying to do. And, and a lot of people, I think, uh, there's a lot of opportunity for that, for people to be doing that. So I'm hoping more of that will happen. Okay, so finally, uh, your tips for academic philosophers, or what's your advice for those who want to get into academic philosophy? Yeah, wow. So. You know, I spend a lot of time um, talking to, to junior people in the field and, and really trying to be as supportive as I can and trying to help people who want to want to get into philosophy and or, or doing it. And, um, you know, a lot of a lot of this now depends on, you know, socioeconomic and political things that are that are happening um, in the world. There's not as much investment in philosophy as I would as I would like. Yeah. Um, but I think I would say personally, it's incumbent upon philosophers to seek out people and to convince them to invest in philosophy. Mm -hmm. I think philosophy is maybe more important now than it's ever been. Mm -hmm. Because think of all the ethical questions, think of all the philosophical questions that are that are arising now in all areas. Uh, especially, you know, with the explosion of, of information technology, there's there's just tons of places where philosophers can be useful and where philosophical questions are really important and need to be answered and taken seriously. So I think 
we need to do a better job of convincing and communicating to people why philosophy is important and and why people should invest in philosophy and in philosophy departments mm -hmm. having said that <laughs> um having said all that my view on things is pretty simple i'm pretty simple-minded i think i got into philosophy knowing that it was a really improbable thing for me to be able to do i got really lucky and i ended up being very successful in the field okay that was really super fortunate and 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 very lucky but i will tell you this it, i it doesn't it didn't matter i was never that was never it was never on my radar you know when i was coming out of wisconsin i was like look if i could just get a job teaching logic and that allows me to think about philosophy uh, that'd be a win um so um and so i think Look, it, philosophy, is, it's the kind of thing that you, you really got to love it. I mean, you, you really got to be in it because you just love it and you can't see yourself doing anything else. And, and for me, that was, oh, that was the case. I, I consciously decided to get into it knowing that, I mean, I carried huge amounts of debt for decades, okay? Um, I never worried about that. I never worried about any of that because I couldn't see myself doing anything else. Mm -hmm. And I would say, if that's who you are, if that's what you're like, if you just can't help but do philosophy, you can't picture your life really without being a philosopher, then you should just you should just go for it. You should do it. Um, you should do it knowing that it's going to be challenging, practically speaking. It's going to be challenging. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be a difficult road for sure in practical terms. But you know, if you're like me and you just can't imagine you're doing doing anything else, then then you should just go for it. You know, you should go for it. And you know, there are still a lot of opportunities for for careers in philosophy. A lot of them are in ethical in ethics or applied ethics and things like that. Um, okay, all right. You know, I view that as more a strategic question about how to become a how to make it a profession. Mm. right so that you can actually do it and i so in my mind that's a practical question you know and and there's many different ways of doing that um but like i said i think if you really love philosophy and you really can't picture yourself doing anything else then you should absolutely go for it now you should be aware it's going to be a long road uh it, it, you're, you don't get into it for the money that would be a mistake. Um, that's, you know, if, you know, it better not be for that reason, because that's not a good idea. Um, not that that can never happen, but, it, you know, it's a long shot. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think, I think you've really got to be, got to love it. If you just say, so when, like when I was uh, at NASA and I was like, I can't do this. I just, I can't live this way. I could just picture myself uh, years hence, um, just not being able to motivate myself to keep doing that. Uh, and so I knew I had to become a philosopher because that was the only thing I could see myself doing. Mm -hmm. And and I, and that's why I did it. And I never looked back because I just, there was, I just didn't see any other thing that I could be happy doing. But I, but I do think it, it for, at least for me, it helped that it was a calling in that way. It was really, it wasn't just a job. It mm -hmm. was like, I'm going to be doing this no matter what, whether I like it or not. So let me find a way to do it and survive. <laughs> That's more like what it was. Um, yeah. So I would say, you know, try to, and if you're going to do it, try to seek out people like myself or other people who are interested in trying to help people do that and be successful. Um, so go to summer schools, go to conferences, go to, you know, try to really network and get to know people in the field. Um, mm. And uh, I, I would say, reach out to me. If you're out there and you're listening to this and you want to get into philosophy, reach out to me. I will do whatever I can to help. Um, and there's a lot of helpers out there. You know, it's like, yeah, you got to find the helpers if you want to do this because you're going to need them. But yeah. they're out there. There are people who are helpful and there are communities that su are supportive. So like the formal epistemology community, very supportive of each other, that especially the junior scholars, they support each other and they really help each other. And I think having that kind of network really helps. Um, you know, you need that, you know. So seek out people who are like-minded, go to conferences, go to summer schools, get as involved in, in, in the network of philosophy, the social network of philosophy as you can. Mm -hmm. and, I and I think if you do that, you absolutely can do it. Of course it can be done. 
yes, it's challenging, and there and right now, especially with the pandemic, it's hard. But I but but look, philosophy is going to is if I have anything to say about it, philosophy is going to be around, and people <laughs> are going to be investing in it, and I know that I'm going to be working on that, and I'm going to be trying to support people who want to do it. Um, and I know a lot of people feel that way, and there's a lot of people working on that to try to make that happen. So, yeah, I would say reach out to people, try to find people who can give you advice or encouragement, and, f and try to find a community you can get into where you have peers that will also support you in philosophy. And and that can be done. That there, th this is a thing you can do. Um, so yeah, I would I would just encourage people if they if they really love it, they should do it. They should go for it. Okay. Okay, not not in a Pollyanna way where you think every you know it's easy, <laughs> uh -huh. but but it's doable. It's doable, and you, I'd say you just have to find the right network, the right way to get into it, and to have your own community and your own set of peers that are doing it. I think that's really important. So yeah, summer schools, conferences, anything you could do to to meet as many people interested in philosophy as possible and make as many connections in philosophy as you can. I think that, that's what I always did. And it that works. Okay, so would you say that your career in philosophy is worth it? Oh Jesus! Oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, but you know, in a way, like I said, that's sort of. I mean, you know, that's, yeah. But I'm like I'm I'm like one of the luckiest people in the in the, the in the field maybe ever. So yeah, for sure. I mean, I could not imagine myself doing anything else, and. I'm just so fortunate. I have an amazing set of colleagues at Northeastern. I love my department um, and I just love my students and I, everything I'm doing. I couldn't imagine doing anything else. Um, yeah, it's, it's the only, it's the, it's, it's, it's the best of all possible lives for me, for sure. <laughs> um, but I did get super lucky, obviously. But, um, but I think I'd feel that way no matter what, as long as I could teach philosophy and do philosophy and support myself. That's really all I ever wanted. Um, I kind of won the lottery, but mm. even if I hadn't, I would be just as happy, I think. Okay, so thanks again, Professor Feitelson, for sharing your time with us and your expertise. For you guys, join me again for another episode of Philosophy and What Matters, where we discuss things that matter from a philosophical point of view. Cheers. Thanks, Dan.